Hey everyone and welcome to JS for Justice. Tonight we're talking about a case that involves a young mistress, a husband and wife, and it's not a good mix. Tonight we're talking about the case of missing Heather Elvis. I remember following this case when it was happening and I was really surprised in my research to find some pretty recent updates which I will be sharing in part two. Heather Elvis is a native of Horry County, South Carolina. She graduated in 2011 from St. James High School in Murals Inlet. She was the oldest daughter and when she graduated from high school her parents allowed her to move out and be in her own apartment shortly after graduation. She shared this apartment with a roommate from out of state. At the time, Heather worked as a waitress at the Tilted Kilt in Myrtle Beach. She also worked at the House of Blues in North Myrtle Beach. At the same time, she was studying cosmetology. On December 17th, 2013, Heather Elvis went out on a first date with a man that ended when he dropped her off at her apartment at 1.15 a.m. the next morning. A half hour later, she called her roommate, who was away visiting her family, to tell her how the date had gone, although there are records of her cell phone being used over the next two hours. She has not been seen or heard from since that morning. The date had been Elvis's attempt to move on after a relationship with Sidney Moorer, a repairman she had met through her job at a local restaurant that had ended two months earlier. According to some accounts, this had been a result of Moore's wife, Tammy, learning of her husband's affair. She sent Elvis several confrontational text messages, but denies any role in her disappearance. Phone records show that Elvis's phone and Sydney's were used to call each other several times in the early hours of December 18th. He says the two did talk with each other briefly on two occasions, but also denies any wrongdoing despite security camera footage showing a truck believed to be his driving to and from the boat landing where Heather's car was later found. Where is Heather Elvis? It was early June of 2013 when Heather took notice of Sidney Moore, a 38-year-old married resident of Sacosti, South Carolina, who repaired the kitchen equipment at one of the restaurants she worked at. She tweeted early that month Quote, that she had a taste for men who are older. Her roommate, Bree Warlman, also a co-worker at that time, recalled that Elvis pointed him out to her at work. Almost a month later, she expressed sexual interest in, quote, the guy who builds things at my job. A July 12th tweet responding to a friend who told Elvis that she had a lot of explaining to do, named a Sydney as someone she would go out of her way to see. Four hours afterwards, she follows up with, quote, baby did a bad, bad thing. And, quote, I'm in way too deep, but watch me get deeper. Friends and co-workers recalled that Elvis also discussed the relationship she was having with them as well. Sydney would often come to the restaurants when he was not working to deliver coffee and bagels to her. Moore considered asking her to work as his children's nanny should him and his wife move to Florida as they were considering doing. Moore said his affair with Elvis was primarily confined to September. Late that month, Elvis tweeted that once upon a time, an angel and a devil fell in love. It did not end well, which has since been interpreted as referring to the relationship by then ended. Shortly afterwards, Moore's wife, Tammy, found out about the affair, which made her very angry. Warlman said Tammy made Sydney call Elvis and end the affair with her listening. Sydney, she says, told Elvis that she was, quote, nothing to me, just someone who spread your legs. Warlman said Sydney basically tore Heather apart as a human being and made her feel horrible about herself. Tammy, who later told a friend that her husband and Elvis had confined their relations to oral sex, also sent the younger woman texts and pictures of herself and Sydney having sex. 
to make sure her husband remained faithful to her. Tammy handcuffed him to the couple's bed every night. He later changed his phone password to one only she knew and accompanying him wherever he went outside the house. He agreed to all of these restrictions in order to save their marriage. She also made him get her name tattooed right above his crotch. However, with all of this going on, Tammy having Sydney do all of these things to prove himself to her, Tammy continued to contact Elvis, texting her, quote, Hey, sweetie, ready to meet the missus? And threatening her physically or implying that she was going to kill her husband. On November 1st, Elvis texted back that she was, quote, No one you need to worry about anymore. Tammy also tried to get Elvis fired from her job at the Tilted Kilt, calling the restaurant regularly and telling them her husband would stop repairing their equipment as long as Elvis continued working there. At one point, Sydney reportedly managed to text Elvis again, telling her that his wife had not objected to the affair itself, since she also had a lover, but to his lying about it. She asked him when he would have his phone back, and he said the relationship was over. She agreed, but she wanted Tammy to stop calling the tilted kilt. Heather said, quote, I lost hours today because they sent me home after she kept calling. However, on November 5th, when Elvis last saw Sydney, she retweeted a joke by comedian Daniel Tosh that seemed to be indirectly referencing the affair. Quote, hey, married fellas, you can either cheat on your wife or murder her. Never both. That's when you get caught. That appeared to be the end of communications between Heather and the Moorers. The couple and their two children left South Carolina to drive to Disneyland for a vacation on November 19th. They returned on December 11th. At the time that the Moorers returned from Florida, Heather, according to friends and family, was recovering from the affair. She had gotten a job at a beauty parlor in downtown Myrtle Beach. She started just before Christmas, and she was eagerly anticipating to begin attending church regularly, along with her roommate, Bree. However, she had put on weight and co-workers at the Tilted Kilt noticed that her uniforms had gone up three bra sizes. Elvis was concerned she had become pregnant, possibly by Sydney. Her manager at the Tilted Kilt said she had taken one pregnancy test, which came back as, quote, error. On the night of December 17th, she went on a first date with another man, Stephen Chiraldi. Starting at 10 p.m., he drove her around in his car looking at residential Christmas lights in the area. They later drove to the parking lot of the Inlet Square Mall, where he taught her how to drive his manual transmission vehicle. Elvis sent photos of herself using the stick to her father and to her roommate Bree. Chiraldi dropped Elvis off at her Carolina Forest apartment around 1.15 a.m. He is the last person known to have seen her. 20 minutes later, a call was placed from a payphone to Elvis's cell phone. It lasted five minutes. Shortly afterwards, Elvis called Worrellman, who was then out of state visiting her family for the holidays. Elvis said that Sydney had called, telling her he was planning to leave his wife and asking her to meet him. Worrellman, who described her roommate as hysterical during the conversation, counseled her not to do so. After two minutes, the call was ended, and Elvis's whereabouts have not been conclusively established beyond 1.45 a.m. on December 18th. On the evening of December 19th, Elvis's green 2001 Dodge Intrepid was found. It was parked perpendicular to the spaces it was in at the Peachtree Landing boat launch along the Waccamaw River in Sacosti, about eight miles from her apartment. It was locked, and when opened, her phone, keys, and purse were not inside. Calls to her phone went unanswered, and she was not at her apartment, nor either of her jobs. Horry County Police began a missing person investigation. Chiraldi, the last person known to see Elvis, was quickly cleared. The day after the car was found, a search of the area around the boat landing found no sign of Elvis. Later searches of the riverbed down to the Winya Bay, a team of rescue divers from Coastal Carolina University were likewise fruitless. A set of bones discovered in another area nearby on New Year's Day were later found to belong to a male. 
investigators were able to obtain Elvis's phone records, which showed considerable activity on the preceding morning over the two hours after she told Worrellman that Sydney had called her. Although they could not say whether Elvis was the one using it, Pings showed that at 2.30 a.m., a call had been made from the phone to the payphone that had made the call Heather said came from Sydney, but no one answered. Shortly afterwards, it was taken to Longbeard's Bar and Grill, elsewhere in Carolina Forest, where it remained for 15 minutes. After the phone left, it was taken as far away as Augusta Plantation Drive, whereupon it returned to Longbeard's for another 15 minutes. At the end of that time period, a call to Sydney's cell phone was placed from it, but it was not answered. The phone appeared to be in motion, suggesting it had left Longbeard's. Within five minutes, it was back at Elvis's apartment. It remained there another five minutes. During that time, it called Sydney's phone again, then located at his home, resulting in a four minute conversation. At 3.37 a.m., about eight minutes after that call ended, the phone is taken to Peachtree Landing. A minute later, three attempts are made to call Sydney's phone from it within the space of two minutes. All are unanswered. At 3.41, another attempt was made. A minute and a half later, data records for Elvis's phone end. Its location could only be identified as somewhere in the Waccamaw National Wildlife Refuge. Tammy and Sydney's phones were also examined. There had been no communication between the two via these phones from November 2nd, the day Sydney would later testify he surrendered his phone to his wife as a condition of remaining married until 4.37 a.m. December 18th, when she sent him a text asking for the pot stickers and orange juice. He replied, yes, ma'am, immediately afterwards. Police found video evidence further linking Sydney with Elvis's activities in the early hours of December 18th. Security cameras at a Myrtle Beach Walmart show that at 1.12 a.m. that night, he entered the store. Seven minutes later, he bought cigars and a pregnancy test and left. Footage from a kangaroo gas station on Joe White Avenue showed Sydney making the call from the payphone around the street to Elvis's cell phone at 1.35 a.m. Investigators also reviewed footage from private security cameras along the three miles between the Moorer's house and Peachtree Landing. Two, one at a home midway along the route and another closer to the landing, showed a dark Ford F-150 pickup truck passing in the direction of the landing at 3.36 and 3.39 a.m. respectively. At 3.45 and 3.46 a.m., the vehicle returns, going the opposite direction. Its license plate is not visible. However, after analysis and enhancement of the video by both the South Carolina Highway Patrol's Accident Investigation Unit and the FBI, it was determined to be Sydney's and it was searched. On February 21st, 2014, Police closed off the section of South Carolina Highway 814 next to the Morer House to execute a search warrant for the property. After 11 hours in which law enforcement searched thoroughly, the Morers were both arrested at home and charged with murder, kidnapping, obstruction of justice, and two counts each of indecent exposure. The latter charge resulted from sexually explicit images found on their phones that were determined to have taken of themselves in public places. The obstruction charges against Sydney were later specified as resulting in his early denial of his use of the payphone, a claim he reportedly retracted only when confronted with the security camera footage from the gas station showing him make the call. At a news conference announcing the arrest, police did not go into detail about what evidence supported the murder and kidnapping charges. The Moorers posted the $20,000 bond set for those two charges, but later waived the bond on the kidnapping charges in favor of the murder charges, of which they were initially held without bond. A month after the arrest, the court imposed a gag order on all participants in the case. Tammy and Sydney had already set the stage of Elvis as being a stalker beforehand on various sites, particularly their Facebook pages, suggesting the police had framed them and were protecting the real killers. The Elvis family tried to fight back, but felt overwhelmed. At one point, they barred a local newspaper, which had repeated in its coverage some of the allegations made against them. 
from a news conference they held discussing the online harassment. In early 2015, the couple were released from jail, where they had been held for 11 months after a judge accepted Tammy's mother's house as collateral, sufficient to guarantee the $100,000 bond on the murder charges. At the bond hearing, prosecutors told the court they still had no direct evidence leaking the couple to Elvis's disappearance. The Elvis family argued against the release, claiming they had received threats from the Moore family and their supporters. So the court required Sydney and Tammy to agree to GPS monitoring and to stay five miles away from the Elvis family home at all times and avoid interacting with any of them on Facebook or any of social media. Due to the continuing threats against Sydney and Tammy and their difficulties finding work, in September, the court allowed the Moorers to move to Florida, where Sydney found a job while the case was still pending. They were required to continue to meet their bail conditions and waive extradition from Florida should they violate them. In March 2016, prosecutors dropped the murder charges on both Sydney and Tammy without prejudice, meaning they could be reinstated later if the state should decide to. The indecent exposure charges were dropped as well, along with the obstruction charge against Tammy. The charges related to the alleged Medicaid fraud also remained. The Elvises said that while they were disappointed, they understood that prosecutors had to make decisions like that, and they hoped that further investigations and trials on the outstanding charges would eventually lead them to finding out what happened to Heather. Heather. 